Great. Um, OK, uh, just uh, quickly before I upload my presentation and then I'll stop seeing all your faces uh, because that's what happened when you're remotely. I just wanted to um, to say hello and to thank you very much for the invitation. Obviously, Professor uh, Hoos, thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure for me to be here and remotely. I did want to come in person, but uh, uh, I'm glad I didn't because I probably would be um, trapped in some British airport. I don't know if you've heard that um, there's an even bigger misery in the UK um, at, at this point than normally. Um, so my name is Olga Martin Ortega. I'm professor of international law at the University of Greenwich. As uh, has been said, I, I lead a, um, a research group on business, human rights and the environment. But I'm also a member of the Board of Trustees of the London University's Purchasing Consortium, the Board of Directors, sorry. This is a um, university purchasing consortium, as its name says, uh, in the UK, this is a very common uh, way to organise procurement through collaboration, and I will be mentioning a little bit more in my presentation. Um, uh, LUPC, the London University's Purchasing Consortium, has been pioneer in uh, addressing modern slave in supply chains and I'll talk a little bit more about its impact um, in the wider public sector and uh, adding to this I'm a member of uh, the board of trustees of the or electronics watch so I'm not partial in my uh, enthusiasm for collaboration both within purchasing bodies and within uh, institutions uh, in their role as the public buyer, but also with the involvement of civil society and uh, organizations that can help us monitor um, the human rights violations on the ground. So with these disclaimers uh, and the um, uh, the final disclaimer that I'm Spanish and I probably will pronounce everybody's names wrong uh, and uh, and I probably will, even my English isn't that great, but um, I will I will start my presentation now. So. Great, so. Um, I've been asked to talk about human rights and university supply chain and uh, to present where are we now, but also mostly um, the uh, lessons from the UK. And uh, it, it is important, as uh, Professor Hutz has said, about um, why looking at the UK, because it is true that in the UK we kind of woke up to this reality. Uh, a bit earlier than uh, than in other places, mostly due to some advances, normative advances, but also there is a long uh, practice and a long uh, awareness in the uh, public sector in the UK to look at the impact, the both the um, environmental and social impact of its uh, procurement. So it is actually uh, a very interesting, um, I think, the insights to learn and especially not to repeat some of the, um, no, I wouldn't say mistakes, but I would say kind of uh, uh, sort of the hurdles that have made us what, lose some time uh, by uh, maybe not uh, implementing the right approaches. So as I said, I'm Olga Martin Ortega, University of Greenwich, and uh, what I would, the way I would like to um, address or the structure of this talk today is that we I would like to look a little bit about mod, to uh, modern slavery and human rights violations in the global supply chain uh my my uh, colleague has already added some of the made some uh, broad views about this so we'll just go a little bit more into this but um I'm sure that uh, you are more interested in the um UK modern slavery act and the highlight of the five years that we've been doing university reporting so to start with obviously we all as public sector buyers we're all part of global supply chains and, uh, and we're all part and exposed to the risks that they bring with them. So it doesn't matter how, um, you know, how uh, far removed we are from some of these violations. This is our supply chain. And it doesn't matter how much we buy uh, local or we buy national or we buy through quote unquote reputed uh, um, uh, suppliers. All of us every company, every public sector, every individual consumer is part of a structure that um, that perpetuates the 
a violation of human rights and the vulnerability of those which are at the bottom of the supply chain is because of the nature of the supply chain itself, because of the, the uh, excess um, emphasis put in minimization of transaction cost and the, its volatility and uh, need for flexibility to respond very quickly to consumer demand. And we know this from an individual level, you know, today we want this t-shirt, tomorrow we don't. Uh, and the market adapts immediately and the supply chain does adapt immediately, but the same happens at institutional level at um, our global, um, uh, the, sorry, the access of goods and services that we need as universities. But mostly it's related to the, the this governance gap, the deficiency in the regulation and implementation in the countries that produce the goods, but also the lack of extraterritoriality in the countries that consume the goods. So we can have very strong uh, human rights um, uh, frameworks like we do in the Belgium, in the UK, in the EU, um, but this, it, there is little um, application of our rules here to the way goods and services are consumed, are, are, are produced. So setting this um this uh, framework and we know that the modern slavery what well, we call in the uk modern slavery we have a big fight as academics not fight but uh, you know uh, gentle discussions regarding um the um the terminology that we use so the uk loves to use modern slavery whilst uh, really technically uh, we're talking about many different uh, violations, but um, in terms of this amalgamation of violations uh, and uh, that we call modern slavery, we know that uh, there are, according to the ILO, for over 40 million victims of exploitation, of which 24 or nearly 25 million are in uh, forced labor. They're mostly uh, women, especially with uh, regards to, um, you know, victims of commercial, the commercial sex industry. And we have one in four victims of modern slavery are children. We have 30 million uh, children working um, uh, in the supply chain. So we are actually, you know, the, the scale of the violation is is uh, a tremendous but with with the impact of COVID-19, we've seen whole supply chains have collapsed. For example, we weren't buying any more clothes. So where did all the workers of the um, uh, fashion industry go? But we were buying millions of uh, new headphones and uh, cameras. Uh, where did all these new workers come from? So as I said, the term modern slavery includes slavery and servitude, which uh, it, uh, also uh, includes debt bondage or which is, is, is forced labor in a way, or what we call um, yeah, servitude, forced and compulsory labor, child labor and human trafficking. It does not include human smuggling and migration because these are not uh, not part of modern slavery. So what are the, so we'll, I won't uh, go too much into this because uh, obviously we've already had some of the uh, examples uh, presented of how can the uh, universities Modest, uh, university global supply chains be connected to these global um, uh, risks uh, of human rights violations in the goods uh, and services that we procure, including states and uh, and new buildings, new uh, you know uh, access to uh, the, for the, from the materials to the services, laboratory consumables. We've we've known for a long time that. Uh, uh, surgical instruments are made in Pakistan, which is a, a, a really high quality um, source of uh, a, a production of uh, um, surgical instruments, but it is riddled with child labor. The second photo is a photo of uh, uh, workers being uh, bust out of a factory in Malaysia during COVID when over a thousand uh, workers te tested positive for COVID in one night and they were in one day they were bust at night. Um, this is the uh, to the hospital. This is the same factory that was producing the gloves that we, our countries were buying desperately for its supply chain. 
So we, we've known the examples of electronics, the examples of food, especially the, the food industry, but also vegetables, as we've heard. And for example, cleaning and security, which are interestingly some of the um, uh, sectors that are always, as at least in the practice of the UK, always said to be safe because uh, it's considered that the risk to uh, services is less because the, the, the um, workers are recruited locally and are generally recruited through what universities call reputable um uh, companies so we do have a lot of uh, risk of, of um abuse in cleaning and security as well so i want to set up the um the normative and the regulatory framework that will lead me to talk about the uk modern slavery act so briefly and and uh, just um, as only as the set up, setting up of the framework we have a whole new set of norms on uh, uh, business human rights and responsible supply chain. As uh, Professor Hurst has said, we are really now conscious that we have to try to avoid adverse human rights impact on business and commercial activities. And this includes any commercial activity, also public sector commercial activity. We have a series of international human rights and labor law uh, um, rights obligations. Uh, the human, human rights, uh, UN guiding principles, business human rights, and the development, the, the sustainable development goals. So if you allow me, I'm just going to um, uh, go uh, quickly through this, uh, basically pass them on so I can move on to the UK Modern Slavery Act. The a practice in the UK, as I said, comes very much uh, um, in the framework of already um, very conscious practice. Um, it has been mentioned the UK uh, flexible framework, uh, sustainable flexible framework. In 2013, the UK uh, passed the um, Social Value Act, which established that all public uh, sector buyers had to make an evaluation of how was their procurement adding any social value to the local community, for example. So in 2015, the uh, UK passed its Modern Slavery Act. That it's a it's a uh, or it's a piece of legislation that is not only referred to the economic activity, but it's mostly uh, to do with the protection of victims' rights, the the enforcement powers of the police. But it contained this clause, this uh, section 54, where it established an obligation of transparency in supply chain. The Transparency in Supply Chain uh, Clause established that commercial organizations must publish an annual statement on their efforts to prevent modern slavery in their supply chain. So when the UK government issued guidance as to how do we understand what is a commercial organization, it first established a threshold. So all the commercial organizations that um, have a turnover of over 60, uh, uh, sorry, 36 million um, pounds a year and established that it had to be anybody or partnership that carries business as long as it's an organization that's incorporated, registered, and it does not matter which is pursues, which is this primary, uh, primary um, uh, uh, sphere of activity, of commercial activity, including charitable or educational aims. And this is where a bit by chance, a bit by deliberately stretching uh, what we had in front of us, um, some, some of us are working already on this, and especially the director of uh, the London University's Purchasing Consortium and myself, we decided, okay, even though universities are not necessarily, this is not necessarily thought for, universities that are mostly public institutions, and it was just really kind of foreseen for uh, this purely private uh, sector, uh, educational private sector. Uh, why don't we start a practice here of publishing this statement the same way that um, the um, commercial uh, organizations have to do? 
think uh, this is just, you know, just a parenthesis here on what is the nature of UK universities. There are at least, uh, well, there's, a, there's uh, around 170 uh, UK universities, which we don't consider them public them per se, because obviously they uh, charge very high fees. They can have income from private institutions, but they do receive public funding and they are um, subject to the UK public uh, sector um, regulation. So they are, uh, you know, semi public. So we decided they actually fit in as commercial organizations because of this semi private part uh, as well. So we started this practice in which the uh, London University's Purchasing Consortium published its first um statement in 2016 and to which many other follow so what does the university the modern slavery act require it requires for all these commercial uh, organizations uh, therefore they include uh, universities to publish a statement to make uh, every year out of uh, every at the end of the financial year as a public statement that is accessible to the public that has a series of formal and substantive requirements. So what are the formal requirements? And this is interesting to, you know, dissect a little bit at this because we will be able to see how it has evolved, this the practice has evolved uh, and what it has meant. So the uh, formal requirements are that the, it has to be approved and signed at the highest senior level. And, you know, in principle, fine, but, of course, you know, it's a it's a public statement of uh, of policy and of strategy and of uh, commitment. But it, it, it would be surprised, you know, you wouldn't be surprised or maybe you would to uh, see how many of the first statements were never signed. How many of the statements literally just fell in the lap of the public procurement department? without any involvement at senior level. And this is very important as we build a practice in the in other um, in other uh, countries. And as I said, you know, what can we learn? This is not public procurement in the, uh, the, the impact in the supply chain, the impact, the responsibilities of a university or any other public body in, um, in towards its supply chain is not just a procurement um uh, responsibilities not just a procurement concern it is a whole institution and if we don't have the um involvement of senior level we don't have uh, you know the avail the necessary resources to do this because it's not easy to do and especially we won't have the accountability when we find that we bought seafood um uh, uh, fished by burmese migrants that had been uh, chained to the uh, uh, the uh, boat for three years, for example, which is an absolute, you know, real example. So it has to be published visibly in the website. This is very interesting as well because the the way we uh, it has evolved is that it, it, we have we have done research in like reading all the uh, all the uh, reports from the, the past five years, not only of universities but also local authorities, uh, museums, galleries. And it, we have had to insist so much on this to be to be made transparent and accessible, and it has been hidden for 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 years. And now we have named and shamed a lot of institutions for this small thing of as if like, well, if they can't find it, they can't uh, criticize us. And it has to be structured and drafted in a clear and comprehensive way. So what are the substantive requirements? And this is where we can learn more about practice, the practice of institutions. Um, at the university, uh, the, uh, it's interesting because these substantive requirements have not been uh, compulsory. It's just a guidance, no, of what, what the kind of content that it should come. It will, they will become compulsory. So uh, organizations need to disclose or need to present, remember, in a clear uh, and accessible way. Uh, and transparently and um, and in the website, in the home page of the website, was the organizational structure. And this means who has the responsibility over which um, that type of decisions. What are the vision priorities and policies of the institution or the organization? What is 
the, the supply chain, what do we uh, purchase? What, what is the supply chain? And uh, uh, what are the main risks or the uh, risk assessment? And um, what are the due diligence uh, steps that we take or the organization take and their effectiveness and plans for the future? So let's zoom in into the practice and let's zoom in into what we've learned, which I hope is useful um, for yourselves, both as practitioners, but also as people that are planning uh, policy and strategy, and of course for researchers, my fellow researchers, which I'm always um, always have at the forefront as well of my uh, own analysis. So uh, my my team, my research team, has done this uh, this uh, the screenshot so you can see is from our website where we've done an analysis over the past five years uh, of all the reports of the universities and of local authorities, as I said, uh, started from the financial year of 2016-2017. So uh, we're just uh, about to finish the, the um, uh, 2020 report. Obviously, during COVID, two things have happened. Both uh, universities stopped reporting basically just reproduce the old reports or just all together stop reporting and uh my self my researchers and i we stopped being able to do anything because we're stuck at home with uh home schooling uh an eight-year-old and uh and trying to just to, you know tread through a gazillion of new systems so that's why you know we, we were um um ourselves making these uh, reports every year, but now we've, we have a little gap there. But what we've learned, right, it's been quite interesting because then we've seen um, how the process, whether the process has matured, both the process of reporting, but also the due diligence processes within the institutions. So whilst we started with something like 60 reports in 2016, we have 138 statements this year. Uh, sorry, which I should call them statements, modern slavery statement. Uh, and out of 160, 100, it's between 160, between 170 higher education institutions, because it depends on like the, the threshold of private um, uh, financing that they have. So what have we learned in these years? So regarding formal requirements, we have better transparency and accessibility. I think we've really been successful in transmitting the um, message to universities and public sector and even to the private sector that, you know, it, it, this, is a, this is a learning process for all of us. Uh, being transparent, saying what you found, whether you found uh, risks in your supply chain is not uh, that it was there is a risk to make a more scrutiny, obviously low hanging fruit as well. You know, reports, uh, journalists, uh, civil society, they pick up on the information they have. So headlines of the University of Leuven buys uh, uh, vegetables produced in greenhouses that um, don't pay a minimum wage is obviously a shocking um, uh, highlight uh, or a like headline that nobody wants to see. However, we've understood that this is uh, the, the more transparent we are, the more capacity we have to address the issues. And in fact, all these, uh, we had a lot of statements that said uh, one line, we don't tolerate, we have set zero tolerance to modern slavery. We have no modern slavery in our supply chain. Well, if you have no modern slavery in your supply chain, then you haven't looked. So this shows me that you haven't, you don't know or, or where to look or how to look. So we have much better transparency. We have uh, people, uh, universities are starting to be proud of having a statement before they put it in their homepage. You know, always kind of at the bottom, a little bit small, but we're, we are um, we are progressing there. And we have better identification of who are the responsible staff and responsible senior management. As I, I think this also has been um, a great uh, advance in these five years in which we've been uh, making a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, awareness to this this point that I made before. It's not just the procurement person, but also 
when uh, uh, we have a, a scandal or when we have a, a real problem that we need to address, we have to involve senior management. This, none of us are equipped to prevent modern slavery in our supply chain. We are, it's, it, it's a team effort, but it's a learning process. So the more uh, senior management gets involved, the more resources and the more um, serious we will take this. Uh, so with regards to substantive requirements, what have we learned? We've learned uh, or, or how we have progressed. We still have a very basic identification of the supply chain. This is, uh, it, it's very difficult to understand the supply chain and it's very resource intensive to map it. Obviously, we all know which our direct contractor, but it's very difficult to find out where tier two, tier three, and let alone tier five, six, not even the massive uh, uh, public, uh, private organizations know how to do it, or at least have not invested enough money in, in uh, finding out how to do it. But we have to um, be able to dig deeper. And for that, we need to be able to pass on the responsibility to our own suppliers. Like, what is your what, who is your supplier? Who works in your supply uh, chain? Who, who who are the people that made this um, the the these new screens that I'm buying from you? I don't know. The supply chain is very complex. Yes, well, it, it is very complex. So make an effort, and the next effort links to the next efforts. But we still don't have a very good uh, capacity to identify our own supply chain and to have a, a real comprehensive view. Among other things as well, supply chains are dynamic, so they change. There, there are some organizations that have very long um, uh, supply chain uh, contracts or relationships and others that come and go very fast. Still, we if we don't know what we're looking at, we don't know how we can uh, address it. So we've also learned in this uh, five years of reporting that uh, there's widespread development on policy and a strategy. And actually, there is an increased relevance in use of the policies and strategies that have, have been um, uh, that are linked to modern slavery publicly. It used to be, you know, the first statements, it was all about uh, yeah, we have a sustainability policy and we have a safeguarding policy. There were things like we have a clean vehicle policy, uh, clean energy. Yes, yes, the all very, very important and relevant. How do you connect this with your risk of human rights violations? So uh, the first reports were just like a barrage of, po of policies that was, uh, you know, it contradicts this whole thing of having an accessible and clear uh, statements. If you have to read over 20 pages of policies, including, you know, the induction policy of your staff, uh, if you become bored on what this uh, or not as centre is focused on. So with regards to risk assessments, we have seen that there is an improved uh, uh, level of reporting on risk assessment, which means uh, organisations are starting to know what to do in terms of identifying their risks. At the first year, it seems like, well, where do I even start of understanding what my risks are? Shall I just go to the internet and say, what is the problem with computers? Well, at the beginning, yeah, actually, that's how we have to do it. That's how research works as well. You're going to say, OK, what is the problem? But now we have a lot of intelligence and information out there. We know which are the main sectors and the main sectors that are or generally um, mentioned in the UK uh, modern slavery statements of universities are electronics and ICT, foodstuffs and catering, construction and works, garments, laboratory equipment. And we've got, you know, after COVID, so the forefront, gloves and PPE a real, uh, 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 have real um, uh, jump to the headlines. Office supplies, estate goods and services, the cleaning and security, and library resources and books. So we we now have many more resources to do this risk assessment. And how do we uh, do this risk assessment? And I will do this more in the in the due diligence um, uh, breakout session. It's like we we have to identify the general risk in the in supply chains, which supply chains have risk and then the actual risk for me. 
And then we go back to this idea of if you don't know your supply chain, you don't know whether the cotton comes. Uh, are, we, are we bringing the cotton from Spain? That doesn't mean that it, that it is not risky. Are we bringing the cotton from India? Are we bringing the cotton from uh, Xinjiang province in, the, in China? It's not the kind of risks that my supply chain is exposed to is different. So uh, that's, that's in terms of risk assessment. And then in terms of the due diligence processes itself, it's very important to highlight how public sector buyers have started uh, be, uh, using the tools that they know to use, the tools that is your everyday tool, which is tenders, a work criteria, contract clauses. So we have increasing number of, uh, of uh, uh, um, a work criteria that regard to social and uh, sustainable green uh, procurement as well. And we've got more practice in green procurement. And But we're now increasingly including uh, human rights to diligence of the supplier as part of our own award criteria and the use of contract clauses. And uh, I'm a human rights lawyer, but I, I had, uh, you know, I, I, I tried very hard to uh, come up with this, uh, how, as, as a lawyer, always looking at how do I make this legally binding? And all I could think about was through contract clauses. That's why um, with colleagues, I, I drafted contract clauses for Electronics Watch, drafted contract clauses for LUPC, and it's, obviously very difficult to uh, first negotiate the contract clause to be included in the contract, but then to implement it and to actually make use of it once we've got the risk, like things like terminating a contract. And hopefully we can discuss that in our the breakout session. We are increasingly using external tools like certification, for example, and uh, Professor Fuss has mentioned that this one uh, talking about fair trade. And, uh, and risk assessment tools are put MSAT, which is the Modern Slavery Assessment Tool, which is a UK, is a UK tool, but um, we have many, many other examples. And affiliation to Electronics Watch features very high in the UK because, uh, uh, well, because we, we purchase through purchasing consortia, as I said, and the, we're affiliated through purchasing consortia, but also it was uh, in the, the UK, universities were quite pioneer in this, and I'm so happy to see that it's growing in Belgium. Um, uh, uh, public sector buyers have to report on their effectiveness, and this has been really difficult <laughs> to figure out how to report on effectiveness or your of your due diligence policies and strategies on the supply chain. So mostly we do it as we know how to do uh, with regards to measuring effectiveness, which is through key performance indicator. But it, we have really struggled to define useful key performance indicators and then to prove that we've met them. Uh, so that's something that practice needs to continue and therefore, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward for uh, Flemish universities to maybe guide us in that. And training, uh, the Modern Slavery Act required uh, uh, to uh, report on training. This was what the, at the beginning everybody used to do, just like, oh yeah, we've trained this amount of people. Oh, we've trained this amount of people. It was kind of a, 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 an easy win to put in your report. Uh, we have less emphasis now on training and and uh, or at least more generic train uh, less emphasis on generic training um, training oh, training sorry. So, uh, but we're still really in need of specific training. We, I've done lots of gener generic training, but tra uh, training. <laughs> But for example, Electronics Watch does a lot of specific training on the electronics industry and other other uh, organizations. The Fair Trade uh, um, Advocacy Office does a lot as well on public procurement and due diligence. So it is uh, my, we are less alone as, as public buyers now than we we were before. So um, this is some of the highlights that I hope are useful from the UK and are useful to uh, you know, support your practice, start a debate on some of the practice that may not have and I still um, uh, nascent. And uh, of course, I, I am here at your uh, disposition and I am absolutely delighted to 
to share any other insights that I have or you, you think will be useful.